Can you put up cardinalcowboy.com on there? Yeah. Well, you guys are awesome. Thanks for a uh, packed house we got here today. And, uh, you know, I, my, my passion is to help inspire those who, you know, every one of us is looking for some kind of passion in life, something we can really draw from and, and you know, fulfill, fulfill ourselves. So we feel like we're here for a reason, right? So uh, I was asked to talk about what does it take to become a public speaker? And so, you know, they say there's a couple fears that people have. One is being naked in front of an audience, right? And the other is to be having to speak in front of an audience. And so those are the two things that really people are absolutely completely afraid of. One of those are kind of being funny with. But to, be, but to speak in front of an audience is, is something that gives a lot of people a lot of pressure. But there's a lot of people that have a, a desire to do that. And they wonder, how is it you go about doing that? And it was something I wanted to do, too, especially after what I went through with my accident and my coma. Um, so I would say to you, the, the number one thing that you've got to have if you're going to become a public speaker is a passion towards something, whether that's towards helping kids or somebody you know that was hurt in an accident or somebody that, um, or just helping an organization that you, you know, if somebody had cancer, you've got to have some kind of a passion. So for me, that wasn't too terribly difficult because I came out of a coma. I was lucky to survive. Uh, and so my passion became... Uh, to share my message with believing in yourself and proving that you can do anything you, you really set your mind to. So the, the most important step then next is to develop some kind of a story, right? You've got to have a story. Uh, they, they, in doing sales, they say that stats tell, stories sell. And if you want to get people compelled to do business with you or to follow you or to listen to you, you've got to have a good compelling story to do that. And it's not going to be the story about the kid who had great parents that, you know, that helped, helped him get through school. That is not compelling. That's not exciting. That's what everybody, but matter of fact, that would turn people, a lot of people off. But you can use the same story just told a different way when you talk about, hey, I was the kid that was fighting for life, was hit by a drunk driver, was in a coma, and they gave me less than 50-50 odds to survive. So that story gives a little more is a little more compelling, a little more exciting when you understand that you know I had my arms were restrained. I pulled my arms out of the restraints and then pulled the ventilator out of my own throat. So let me tell you my story. So back when I was 19, this is four or five years ago, or more. <laughs> I use that joke all the time. But uh, I was I was going to college at Central Methodist University. I transferred there to play baseball. About 18 months prior to that, I had won the same award as David Freeze. Anybody know, know David Freeze? Also Ryan Howard. Ryan Howard um, also won that same award for the Slava St. Louis Amateur Baseball Association Most Valuable Player. And that's really the real competitive league you play in right before you go uh, to college. Um, Dave played that league. Ryan played that league. We all won the, the MVP for our teams. And I lost the MVP for the whole league to a guy by the name Brian Rupp, who's now the AA manager for the Washington Nationals. So fast forward, I'm in college. I decide we're going to come back to St. Louis, visit some friends, meet up with some people. I'm in the back seat. We're, we're going down Highway 109. Everybody familiar with 109, not too far? Go, they're going to Eureka. They're going to drop me off to meet people I was going to go meet up with. And a truck was spinning out of control. And the roads were a little bit slick and hit us head on. So we hit our, the, our, the, the side of his truck hit us head on, causing a horrific accident. So we're on the side of the road. Luckily, the ambulance was a minute and a half away because there's a firehouse not too far from there. And... Uh, we're on the side of the road. They pulled the driver out, Jimmy Barnes, put him in the ambulance. The drunk driver who was driving that truck, who blew, later blew up 0.21, if you guys know the legal limit. The legal limit now is 0.08. It used to be 0.10. Now it's almost three times the legal limit is what, how drunk he was. They put him in the ambulance. <clears throat> I was on the side of the road. They're talking to me, and apparently I was coherent and having a conversation. don't remember any of this. But um, started to have seizures. At the point I started to have seizures, shaking violently, don't remember what that's like either, thank goodness, right? They, they decided, hey, pull the, somebody out of the ambulance, they pulled the drunk driver out and put me in. And they said, if I hadn't made that first trip, I would not have survived. 
So I'm here for a reason, right? That's the first element towards my passion that, yeah. that, that drives that. So yeah, here's that. Here's the car that we were riding in. If you, you'd be surprised anybody survived that accident. The truck that hit us, if we hit it head on to head on, since we hit the side of the truck, the impact wasn't as much. That truck gave a little bit. If we'd hit head on head on, everyone would have, died, would have died. So Jimmy and myself, and there's another passenger, his name was Jimmy and Sean, we all went to the hospital. I made that first trip and proceeded to go into a coma. Jimmy, his head began to swell, and sadly, a few days later, he died. He was the driver of our car, Jimmy Barnes. Um, I proceeded, like I said, to go into a coma, at which point they told my parents, and they called my dad, they got him on the phone. My dad said, I know I can tell how bad this is if I ask one serious question. Can I speak with my son? And when they told him that he could not, he knew it was pretty bad. So at that point, they'd given me less than 50-50 odds to survive. <clears throat> I'm in a coma, St. John's Mercy, now known as Mercy over here, the best trauma unit in, in the area. And um, about day seven, I pull the, my arms out of the restraints, pull the ventilator out of my own throat, and they say, all right, Carter's going to make it. But you're likely to have to take care of Carter for the rest of his life. Not an exciting outcome to predict, but my parents at that point were just happy to have somebody that they could take care of. Some more pictures, I've, I've given a few speeches, and one of them not, not too long ago here at Maryville too. So um, that really is the fuel for my passion. So that, after that, I really decided I wanted to start to share that message and how I overcame that and, and help other people realize that, you know, there's a lot of hurdles in life. People get worried about, you know, the dog peed on the floor, they didn't get the grade, the boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with them. You know, try talk coming out of a coma and telling me what your expectations of life are going to be at that point. So the key to becoming a successful speaker is you've got to have some kind of passion. You can't say, I've got a really exciting story and I'm really neat and it's going to be fun. You've got to tell it with enthusiasm, you've got to get in front of a crowd, and you've got to do something different. How many people would agree that this outfit is something a little bit different than what you would expect, right? All right. But I started doing this for a specific reason, and I remember going to the game, and I said, I'm going to wear the baseball pants with the outfit now. We're going to see what happens here. I might get laughed out of the stadium, but we'll see what the response is. And there were a few people that poked fun periodically, those that are a little less secure with themselves, right? But, <laughs> but most people, I found, had a great response to it. So that really gave me my, my energy, my drive to say, here's, here's my passion. Now, I've got the attention of people. I better darn well do something positive with this. Um, so what is it that fuels your passion? What is it that drives you to do something to, to make a difference? And every one of us will find something like that if you just stick through life a little bit. You're going to go through hurdles, and one day you'll, you'll realize there's something exciting that gets your heart going. And it may not be English class. It may My mom's an English teacher. God love her. It may not be speech. It may not be math. But for me, it was that passion to get in front of people. After my baseball career was over, I wanted to go out and make a difference somewhere doing something else. Um, the next step I took was to really just talk to my friends about my passion and my desire. And what happens when you start to talk to certain friends, people are all connected, right? And so I talked to one friend who says, hey, I know somebody who's a public speaking coach, and I know that people, there's an organization over here and this group over here that would like to hear your story. And then you start to begin to speak to groups that are a lot of times very small groups, sometimes 10, 15 people. And then you get to where you develop your story, and they're going to hear this, and it'll, it'll progress from there. Then start to work with that coach if you can find somebody that will have that passion um, to help you with that. Because to get that, once you've gotten to a level where you've got the, the feedback of a professional speaker, now you can you really go on to the next level. And so I work with a guy by the name of Shep Hyken, and he does speaking. That's what he does for a career and, and, and travels the world talking to organizations about how they can optimize their customer service. Uh, but he's worked with me, and I see him at the Blues game every time I end up sitting close to him um, at, at the Blues game. Uh, the other thing is that often you want to customize your speech. If you guys notice, I'm taking my notes off my cell phone here. Uh, customize your speech to your audience. Today I'm talking about speaking publicly. A few a couple months ago I was talking to a disabled handicap group. Uh, and they, they, they wanted me to just speak about how it's not a disability, it's a disability, but it's an ability they have. And they really, because they've gone through something traumatic or difficult that made them stronger than most of the average person is, is capable of. So customize your, your argument, your, your speech, your message to the audience that you have in front of you. Um, get in touch with some of the organizations that will do this. How many people have heard of the National Speakers Association? Okay, that's a great organization to become in contact with. You can get on their newsletters, and that was one of the requirements I had from Shep was that I had to subscribe to their email list. So I get the emails every every day, every week that come out related to that. And then more actively 
actually seek these speaking engagements. Because there's a lot of organizations, if they just know that somebody is there that will do the speech, and, and many times you're gonna have to start off doing these speeches for free, right? Then they will gladly have you come in and do so. And right now I go back and forth between getting paid or, or doing them for free, and one kind of helps the other. Right now I'm in front of an audience and I'm giving my advertisement for whatever, 40, 40, 40, 35, 40 kids in here, college kids that'll hopefully tell my story to somebody else and say, hey man, the Cardinal Cowboy might come out and talk to you and your group about his, his story and what he overcame. So every time you speak to somebody, it's an opportunity to advertise and promote yourself a little bit. You, after you actively seek these, these campaigns, these speeches you want to work on, consistently present something that stands out with a strong positive message. It's neat to be in front of people and to talk to organizations. And, 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 and when I first started doing this, I got a lot of attention just by virtue of wearing a goofy outfit and, and uh, carrying a replica trophy around. But I bet figured out very quickly that if I really wanted this to s sustain itself, I had to have a positive message that, got to, that was associated with that. And so that's what I've decided to do. And I, and I talk about my accident and what I overcame uh, based on what, you know, how I came out of a coma. So the next big, best example I have is well, who is it? This is a speech that I've given to a number of people. And life is so true about who it is you choose to associate with, right? And, and if you've seen, they talk about it, you're going to predict who it is or how successful you become based on who it is that you associate with. The, the closest 10 friends you've got are going to be who they can predict that you will be. If you hang out with somebody that's doing stuff, you know, that is inferior to the law and doesn't, I mean, that's who you're associated with. How are you going to get associated with groups of people that want to become leaders and become public speakers or, or lead the community? You can't do that working with the wrong people. You have to make sure you're associated with the right people. So part of my messages though is do you want to be associated with those who conquer or who those who make excuses? With those who are leaders or those who are followers and are dependent? Those who are victors or those who are victims? Those who are winners in life or those who are spectators and losing in life? Those who are champions or those who are quitters? Those who are going to get it done or those who are going to let it be done to them. We all would love to choose, would choose to associate with those who are going to conquer the world. Those who are leaders, a victor, a winner, a champion, and someone who is going to get it done. Right? So what are you waiting for? Don't let the grade or the job you didn't get or the relationship that didn't work out or the coma that you went through stop you. If I can overcome a, um, overcome a coma, pretty much anything else is, is, is pretty achievable, would you agree? You have to go out and do it, that's it. It's not the hurdle in life that causes life to become so difficult. It's how you respond to that and overcome that hurdle. You see, because if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you are correct. And really think about that. Because if you're talking to yourself every day about what you're not going to do, your body only responds to what your mind is telling it. Right? I know people who go through diseases and have hurdles to overcome that related to sickness and illness, and they get so despondent about what their life has become because of this disease, their body starts to say, okay, we've got to back it down. This, this disease is taking over my body. I can't beat this. I can't win. Well, the body just says, oh, well, if that's the strategy, then we better start shutting down here. But if you believe, hey, man, I can accomplish this. I can beat this. This is just another hurdle. I'm going past this without stopping. The body responds to that. Hey, we better get going here. We, this guy's not stopping for this. We're going to make this happen. This guy's going to make this happen. We got to keep going. That is the essence, I think, to what it takes to become a public speaker, a leader, and somebody who really has a fulfillment out of life. So that's really all of my message was for you guys today. Uh, I know that leaves us a fair amount of time for questions. Tell us what you did with school and work after your accident. Uh, so look, give, give a little bit more of my story. So. <clears throat> Uh, come out of college, um, decided that I was not going to be a victim at that point anymore, uh, stayed in school, went to grad school, and then started working for a little brewery based out of St. Louis. How many of you have ever heard of Anna's or Bush? Right? Right? 
But up until InBev came in there, I ran the email systems for Anheuser Bush. So I go from coma, somebody that they, they argue may not be able to take care of himself, to where I manage 30,000 mailboxes, three corporate servers with the redundant clustered fiber array attached hard drives and all this cool stuff that literally, and there was a time when things went down and we had a, a server that got wiped out and I turned it on, flipped it back up and everybody's mailbox was empty. So can you imagine 2,000 users on that server, all their mail was gone. Well, who's the guy that also had been naive enough to volunteer to be the restore guy? Well, I'm there now, so there I'm there till the next day at 11 o'clock, pulling tapes on the phone with Microsoft saying, hey, help us get this done. I, I still this day, I'm probably one of 15 people in the world that have ever restored a Windows NT clustered server, blah, blah, with all this. And it's just, I didn't know any better, but I figured out I'm gonna go get this and nothing's gonna stop me. <laughs> so think about where I came from there. Proceeded to go off and after I got laid off, I started my own company, um, developed some really high tech, cool um, ROI pr projection tools. And then recently was hired by the largest, uh, one of the largest marketing companies in the world where I've become the number one sales guy for them in the first month and second month and going on to the third month that I've been there, starting off in spot number one. And none of that has anything to do with any special ability I have. It has a whole, whole lot to do with the, 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 the desire I have and the willingness to never quit. And then beginning to realize, because it's a stepping stone, you start off with one accomplishment that seems minuscule, but once you realize you can do that and you start going up and up and up and you realize these people that I'm working with, they're no smarter than me. They certainly don't work as hard as I do. So now it's just a matter of who's gonna outwork who and get there. And so that's what I've had the pleasure of doing and now I get to help a lot of small businesses. Um, also along the way, I decided to go in and play sports. Uh, again, like I had, and like I said, I was coming up, some people thought I had a good shot at making it as a pro baseball player. But after that dream was squashed, I decided I'm not going to give up. I'm going to go out and try to kick field goals. So I, went to, I walked on for uh, the indoor team, became their backup kicker, then started to kick outdoor um, for the, a couple teams, the Missouri Cyclones, the Missouri St. Louis Bulldogs, the Missouri Wildcats, and had kicked at that point, at this point I've kicked five career 50-plus yard field goals. And after my first 50 yard, I don't know if you guys know what 50 yards is, football guys here, the sports guys and girls will know that that is, right? But that's half the field, right? <laughs> So half the field plus the end zone, if you, but they, they only count the yard. So I was close, close to the half mid, midfield for kicking these. One of the, one of the uh, referees happened to be a scout at the game and came up to me afterwards and says, hey, were you that kicker that kicked the, the one of the game, kick of the last game? And it was a 51 yarder. And I said, yeah, that was me. He goes, well, I work with this little football team based out of St. Louis called the St. Louis Rams. And if you guys have heard of the St. Louis Rams, right? They, they no longer they're back, they went back to LA. But uh, that was pretty exciting when the St. Louis Rams, and then they contacted me and their coach called me and says, hey, this is Bobby April's assistant. We'd like you to come in for a tryout. You know we've got a guy by the name of Jeff Wilkins. And Jeff Wilkins at that time had been uh, an all pro kicker for a number of years. And I said, heck yeah, I mean, I'll do whatever I can. It was interesting, they fired Bobby April months, a few weeks later before I actually got the tryout. I was offered the tryout, didn't get to actually go do it. Then went off and kicked professionally indoors. So this is my first field goal that I kicked, extra point that I kicked professionally, got paid to play. Uh, and so it was one of my dreams that I never gave up on, I believe. You know, I, I could certainly have the capability. So keep in mind, again, going from coma, pulling the, my, the ventilator out of my own throat, say, you're gonna take care of Carter, push me out of the hospital in a wheelchair, to now where I went off and I got paid to kick field goals. And the whole point of that is, Anybody can do anything if they'll never give up. I mean, it's so exciting for me to, to work with kids who've had some kind of a, uh, an amputation or a disability or whatever because they have such a burning desire. They just want to be like you and me. And so that's a great example. That's Alicia. You can't tell in that picture, but she got asked to, to, to walk down the red carpet. She was highlighted as one of the kids that were superstars. So she's a superstar. They asked me to give the speech later that evening to the audience about being a superstar. And she's got, she's got sarcoma, and her right leg, I believe it's her right leg, you can't tell here, right or left leg, is a steel pipe because they amputated it because of her cancer. But she's excited to be a leader in our community, and she walks with pride there. I had to teach her how to sign autographs, because I said, you're going to sign autographs now when you do this. She goes, how do I do that? I say, you write you're just your big initial, and then scribble, and then your next big initial, <laughs> and scribble. And she was walking through the crowd. And there were people who were actually saying, wow, you're really good at signing autographs. So she's a, she's a leader in our community. So, so that's kind of more of the excitement. So um, after all of what I've gone through, my dad recently um, had a stroke. It was, it's been a couple of years by now. 
And, you know, the, the odds were statistically 45%, 55% of people who go through the stroke, the kind of stroke my dad had, is a brain bleed inside of his brain, a pool of blood about that big inside of his brain. We can see the MRI. 55% of the people who go through that kind of a stroke die, don't make it. And so I came into the, as my dad's uh, hospital room and he says, Carter's always so positive. He says, Dad, you have a 45% of survival. <laughs> <laughs> That's less than 50-50 odds, but those are good odds for me because all I need is a little bit of a chance and I'm going to win. I pushed him and now my dad is survived and he's still around and he's still kicking and uh, because he's adopted that same positive strategy and philosophy. And, and, it's, and he's one of the persons I actually kind of learned it from. You need to have that kind of emphasis in your life, I think. So that's, I'll, I'm, if I can't do it for, if I can do it for kids and adults, I can do it for my dad too. All right, who, who's got some questions for me? Go ahead. The gallops. I, I, I'm not familiar with Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I would be interested to learn more about that, and, and I like to learn everywhere I go, too. But yeah, I'll, I'll look that up and maybe uh, figure, find out a little bit more what that's about. But yeah, I mean, like, like your, your brain is just programmed to do what you're told, and if it's thinking negative, you're going to get negative. If you're thinking positive, you're going to get positive. That's the way it works. Yeah, so how old were you before you were able to get your story, like, you know, pretty big Yeah, I, uh, I had actually given a speech about a month later to a group and I was not at all in a capacity where I shouldn't, shouldn't but it was evident that I'd been in a bad accident and bad situation uh, and so then it's just been a constant growing process going you know from the next event to the next event really when I started doing this Cardinal Cowboy thing and you see me at the games and I do this right that's when it really began to, to, to take go to the next level and so now I work with a lot of organizations go ahead What was the recovery like? Is the question? Yeah, um, I don't remember, honestly. They, they, I, I think that's a built-in defense mechanism. I don't, I don't remember being at the side of the road um, having seizures. I don't remember the trip to the hospital. I don't. The first memory I have is when my sister had come to visit me with my parents. My parents camped out at the hospital. My sister was there, and I, uh, I literally, the first first memory was me walking in my nighty out into the hallway, going like this, kind of like whoa. I guess I'm in a hospital. What happened? <laughs> and that was my first memory. I go to every playoff game uh, historically, and I've got a good connection there. With some, it, was, it was interesting. So I, I went to a, an event. Somebody said, "Will you come down to Bush Stadium?" And uh, I said, "Absolutely." And uh, for a charity event, and they rent that out when they're not playing. And so I said, "Yeah, I don't remember. I didn't remember the charity, I, but I remember Bush Stadium Champions Club." And I got there. I'm like, "Okay, memory." Care. It's a great organization. Sounds like, and I, then I started listening. There was a, a young lady talking about her son who had gone through a stroke or through a coma, and was, was you know been fighting for life and hasn't completely recovered yet. And I said, hey, I want to help that young lady. So that lady happens to be one of the most high up you can possibly be with the St. Louis Cardinals, and and so she, uh, I sent her an email and she'll she'll give me tickets when I want them. Yeah, here's some of the field goals just from kicking. So I made this little video. But yeah, so you can see that's on the 43-yard line, so plus the end zone is 53. We lost our camera guy. He's like, oh, where's the ball? Oh, it's all the way down there. There you go. <laughs> so yeah. You had a question back there. What was your question? Yeah, well, I mean, the trophy I carry for the excitement and just represent being a champion, right? And if you, you, you've got one of these, you've become the best there was in the world. I wear the rings, same reason, reminding, we didn't do it just once. We did it 11 times, I don't wear all 11 rings. 
Actually, I wear my, some of my Super Bowl football rings too, but my minor league we went to, won the championship for football too. But um, yeah, I mean, these are just symbols of what, I, I'll never forget Roland Williams, who I did a lot of work with. He won the Super Bowl with the Rams, tight end for the St. Louis Rams when they won it with Kurt Warner. And uh, he was wearing the two rings that he won, NFC Championship and Super Bowl. And I just remember people going, whoa, what's that? So I said, wait a minute, I got rings, I'll start wearing those too. Um, there's also then I have, and I'll, I'll set the trophy down here. I have, just to bring some, I've got the socks. And these I had a special order. But these are the pattern socks. So this is like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm all in, you know, I'm not just doing this halfway. <laughs> and so I've got the socks on too. But, and then obviously the pants and the jersey. When I, when I put the whole thing together, this thing didn't really take off until the day I wore the baseball pants to the game. And then it just it went off the rails. I mean, I had 500,000 hits on my cardinalcowboy.com website in about two weeks. So it was fun. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for coming. If you want to take a picture or get an autograph or ask him any other questions, feel free to do so. Yeah, I'm easy. Make sure that you sign in and have a good day. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it on here, too. Um, he actually has a music video as well. If you haven't seen that, so I'm going to put that on as we close so you can watch that. I'm going to do a group shot of everybody. And what I would like, I do have a request. I forget to do this about 90% of the time. Please go to my fan page and like the fan page. If you've got something positive to say, great. If you've got something negative to say, don't say it. But if you've got, <laughs> <laughs> you got something positive to say, give me a comment and something like that. And, and I do get pictures. David Freeze told me I'm the most photographed guy at Bush Stadium when I was talking to him. And so we run around and do all of our stuff. So, yeah, we'll do a... Are you going to do it? Well, I'll do a group. I'm going to do one like this, selfie mode, right? Okay, you have the... Everybody in? Let me see. All right. And I'm gonna go. I'll go get out in the group here. Thank you, guys. Woo! First, we go like this. There we go. And then I do this. You go like this. All right. I can't stop without. All right. Group shot here. The new organization. Great. All right. All right. Thanks, you guys. Giddy up. Idiot.